थैंक यू आरती रिस्पेक्टेड डॉक्टर उत्तरा सहस्रबुद्धे एंड माय डियर फ्रेंड एंड कलीग इन पॉलिटिक्स आई शुड से पृथ्वीराज चौहान जी अवर एसोसिएशन गोस फार बैक इन द ओल्ड टाइम्स व्हेन ही वाज अ मिनिस्टर एंड आई वाज एन ऑर्डिनरी वर्कर ऑफ द पार्टी friend uh, sujit nair uh, i must actually uh, appreciate both hw news network and uh, the university of bombay's department for uh, really coming up with this novel idea of a debate and uh, since hw news network is known for organizing very civil debates and on this side the civics department is organizing it partnering it so it has to be the debate has to be more than civil so probably we will all end up in more agreements and less disagreements i think and as far as uh, the caa is concerned it is done and dusted so i don't know whether we are supposed to be discussing caa today but there are some pertinent issues that have been raised obviously the present narrative that is emerging as uh, dr utra very rightly mentioned so this narrative is what is generating a, a, an amount of interest and also a little bit of concern so there is no doubt about it that both the government which has brought up ca and also the Uh, people or parties who are opposing it have to be educated on a number of things actually those who are protesting most of the people who are protesting uh, have very little knowledge about the act uh, itself now uh, as madam very rightly pointed out the caa the citizenship amendment act does not mention anything about npr or national register of citizenship nrc it doesn't mention anything it has nothing to do with it so the whole idea that uh, the caa flies on the face of article 14 of the indian constitution it has nothing to do with article 14 of the indian constitution actually that was the initial objection to caa no if you if you look at uh, article 14 of the indian constitution it very very categorically it says the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or equal protection of the laws within the territory of india a person is very clearly mentioned a person is an individual or a company or an association of people whether registered or not registered whether incorporated or not incorporated so everybody under this in the country comes under this now article 14 has two aspects one it involves all those who are already citizens of india it doesn't speak about anyone outside and then it speaks about equality within the territory of india it very clearly says within the territory of india i am sure those who are protesting caa still believe that pakistan is not part of territory of india however much the present government and some people associated with it may want it to be the reality of the situation is pakistan is not part of india yet we don't know about the future future changes <laughs> in 1970 nobody thought bangladesh will appear on in, in 1971 then another objection was about article 15 now what the article 15 says the state shall not discriminate on the grounds of religion race caste sex place of birth or any of them fine similarly article 21 also so the challenge to caa in the supreme court that it infringes article 14 15 and 21 is not going to stand scrutiny at all and then again 
when we challenge caa even a very senior congress leader and uh, uh, a very erudite scholar of uh, uh, the legal field um, mr sibel has himself clarified that let the court decide if the court upholds this act court has every right to uphold an act and court has got every right to strike down an act also but if the court strikes down the parliament can again convene and decide that it is ultimately in the interest of the society that this act has to go ahead because we consider parliament as the supreme authority in this country because parliament represents the sum and total and substance of the people of india it is the parliament and the president who appoint the other areas of governance so parliament is supreme and we all know about shahbanu case how parliament was declared to be absolutely supreme even the supreme court's verdict was turned away down by parliament and amended it was corrected so parliament is supreme but the laws passed by the parliament can be tested on two counts one is it in the interest of the society but the parliament does not have any agency or methodology to say whether it is good or bad for the society so the judiciary can decide whether it confines to the legal provisions as enshrined in the constitution judiciary also draws its legal right and duty or the parameters of law from the constitution so whether it is constitutionally approvable whether it is legal or not the supreme court can decide if there is any illegality about caa the supreme court can point out and tell the parliament to go back to the members and get it corrected amended deleted added or edited this the supreme court can do therefore again the caa has nothing to do with it why caa what actually happened as far as the caa is concerned was that the the parliament was really concerned about it and this is not the first time that somebody is talking about religious persecution in pakistan in fact pandit jawaharlal nehru spoke about religious persecution in pakistan and he he also warned people that we should forget partition and see to it that what is happening in pakistan should not happen in india even mohammad ali jinnah himself when he was speaking to the constituent assembly said that pakistan should be open for all religions everybody but unfortunately he died within 8 months of the for- formation of pakistan if partition had not happened on 15th august 1947 and if we had we- the nerve and courage to wait for another 8 months probably partition would not have taken place at all because this idea of that the fact that jinnah was unwell and he was on his virtually on his deathbed was kept a top secret by the british at that time and we did not have any strategic input into all this information and that's a different story i am not going into those details at all and this is not the forum or place or time to go into all those things so this was the main problem and there was another problem this is i won't say it's a problem but it's a fact of life that islamic countries have a different set of rules and regulations whether they are good or bad is a different issue but we all know if you go by the islamic jurisprudence those who are students of law here would know the maliki school the shafi school the hanbali school and the hanafi school in and pakistan bangladesh and afghanistan are ruled by the sharia now sharia allows these four islamic jurisprudence out of this except hanafi the rest of the three have no place for non believers if you don't believe in islam you have no right to live it's only the hanafi school which accepts that those who do not believe in islam also have a right to live provided they pay zazia the zazia tax is the provision is only in the hanafi school now pakistan has a huge problem even the hanafi school is not very powerful as far as the pakistani judiciary is concerned and the state comes directly under the sharia law in pakistan therefore 
it's a huge problem as far as the non muslims are concerned they are not granted citizenship in the first place even if they are granted citizenship there is a different set of rules for these people so how to sort out this problem the one of the way to sort out this problem is to uh, change pakistan change the template of pakistan make it more democratic and less islamic but that's not the agenda of the government of india for the last 70 years we have not tried that and we should not be trying that also so we are concerned with our country and our people so that was the whole idea of doing it of course it's a very valid question that uh, professor uttara sir sir they suggested that why include bangladesh and afghanistan can could it, was it possible to keep bangladesh and afghanistan out but when we talk in terms of immediate neighborhood there was an urgent need to include these two regions also and then the sikh community in afghanistan was a very vocal community as far as the religious persecution issue was concerned a large number of sikh people sikh community people in afghanistan have already left that place that was another major problem as far as afghanistan was concerned and the sikh community is concerned and then even during the election run up to election in 2014 this issue came up post 2014 during the state assembly elections even the congress party had raised this issue and this whole issue of sikh persecution in afghanistan was raised by none other than colonel Am- amrinder singh uh, the congress chief minister of punjab who wanted that the government of india should do something about the sikh community in afghanistan because it's a, it borders on foreign relations it borders on citizenship granting citizenship which is the prerogative of the central government and if you if we all know about schedule 7 of the constitution which specifically mentions union list state list and concurrent list there are about 97 subjects which fall only under the union list citizenship is one such thing states cannot give citizenship therefore the caa had to be brought in it had to make some provision for afghanistan and bangladesh and uh, as someone who have uh, a little bit of inside information i can tell you that uh, we have had enough interaction with afghan leaders both in the government and outside the government we have had lot of interaction with bangladesh and um, if there are no journalists here i can tell you next week i am going to bangladesh to continue the next phase of track to diplomacy in that so we are we are constantly in touch with uh, at least these two countries as you very rightly said uh, we need the relationship between these two countries for a very valid reason and for very strategic reasons also bangladesh is very important as far as our look east and uh, activist policy is concerned afghanistan is very important for us as far as the future possibilities of uh, erasing durand line is concerned so we have to do lot of things even if for pok and incidentally pakistan and afghanistan are at loggerheads with each other not only as far as pok is concerned but also as far as the durand line is concerned so we need afghanistan we have got excellent relationship with afghanistan in in fact in order to engage more further with afghanistan we have taken up the project of chabar port in iran so that it becomes an entry point of afghanistan so these things are all different ideas of strategy and national security which we are looking at so caa has a very vast uh, gamut it 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 has a great strategic out point outlook and 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 the most important of all these things is that as uh, some people have pointed out it will infringe on the rights of the people and uh, about the migration and other things it does not uh, come into the picture at all because if you see the uh, protest against uh, caa and also the linking of all these protests to npr national population register the purpose of national population register is to make uh, certain data about the social status of the people of india available in 20 in in 2000 in the year 2000 at the turn of the millennium 
we had a vision document for 2020. It was called Vision Document 2020 prepared by the uh, Planning Commission. And at that time, uh, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam also wrote a book, Vision 2020. So they, the whole idea was to have a, some sort of a 6.5 to 7% GDP growth and totally obliterate this below poverty line people so that there should be nobody in the country who, who can be classified as below poverty. So bringing the whole lot of population above poverty was the whole big issue. For this, there has to be certain social programs and how to locate the communities which require maximum social uh, facilities. For this idea, at that time, one of the foremost and the best economists of this country, Dr. Manmohan Singh, he was the Prime Minister and it was Dr. Manmohan Singh who thought about this whole idea and in 2010, the then UPA government proposed this whole idea of NPR. And to, at that time, some state governments and ironically again, if there are no journalists, I can say, including BJP governments, opposed it. <laughs> and they also said that we will not implement. So Dr. Manmohan Singh very wisely introduced two more words. NPR is mandatory. So in 2010, the UPA government's bill on NPR categorically says that it is not only the prerogative of the government of India to do this NPR, but they have to be make it, made it mandatory. So now if a government says, state government says, we will not do NPR, they can be hauled up on the basis of Article 365 of the Constitution, but I don't think we should do that. We will have to create more consensus. What is actually needed today? is a creation of consensus on some of these issues which have a very strong bearing not only on the economic aspect of the country but also on strategy and security of the country. So we have to look at it from a very very broad viewpoint and I wish more such debates and activities take place wherein we register our objections and also inform the government on the possibilities of amending what they have done so that the anomalies that are created or the anomalies that can arise in the future are taken care of. So I really appreciate the efforts of Bombay University and HW to do more on these issues. Thank you.